So hello and welcome to our first session of the seminar introduction to future theories of intelligence with our instructor, Professor Simon Didio. Um, Professor Simon is the Williams S. Dietrich uh, Career Development Chair at Carnegie Mellon University in the Department of Social and Decision Sciences. He's also an external professor at the Santa Fe Institute and external faculty at the Complexity Science Hub Vienna. His work has appeared in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Cognition, Trends in Cognitive Science, Frontiers in Artificial Intelligence, Proceedings of Machine Learning Research, the Journal of the Royal Society, Physical Review Letters, the Astrophysical Journal, and so on. Um, he leads the Laboratory for Social Minds, whose website I can be sharing with you the link for in a minute. Um, and I'll just briefly read the synopsis for our seminar for handing over to Simon. So to study intelligence is to study the power and potential of thought itself. This course will examine the, this most difficult of topics from a scientific and philosophical perspective. It is a research seminar that proposes a fourfold taxonomy of theories of intelligence with the goal of extending our conception of the limits of our mental capacities. The study of intelligence as utility, computation, knowledge, and reflection, I will argue, provides a foundation for severe and more advanced speculation at thoughts from TU. Intelligence is not only a theoretical problem, it is also a political one and has been understood as everything from a distraction from moral virtue to an existential threat to human survival. It plays a central role in political theories, ranging from Plato's golden souls and Hobbes' rational agents to Hayek's decentralized capitalism and Anglo-American bureaucratic meritocracy. The era of thinking machines places more weight than ever on the notion of intelligence with machines of beyond human intelligence expected to both resolve our material needs and usher in a new era of mentality. So that's it. Um, and I'm now handing over for Simon. Thank you, Simon. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Matthias. It's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I was saying uh, just before I uh, just before people logged on, I said this is absolutely terrifying to teach um, a, a seminar to people who actually want to be here. Um, usually, when I teach at Carnegie Mellon or Indiana, these are great places. But I ask the students why they're there, and about half of the students reliably say the primary reason that I'm here um, in your class is to get a certificate and a degree uh, to go out and get on with my life. So, um, in this case, primarily the reasons you're here is to actually learn things. So. Um, you know, if I screw up at CMU, half the class is like, well, fine, I, give me the degree I'm at. Um, let me share my screen. Um, I should also say I see some old friends and people I know very well here, including Alex out of The Guardian. So hello, Alex, I just saw you logged in. Um, I'm going to click on the shared screen here. So hopefully, um, Matthias, can you, um, are you, are you able to see my uh, screen? Yes. Excellent, very good. So um, I'm Simon, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, Matthias listed half the places I published, but the one I'm really proud of is my first publication was in 2600, the Hacker Quarterly, which was a pseudonymous publication when I was, when I was 14. Um, this is a really big class and I was thrilled uh, to see how many people registered. I was also terrified because I wanted us to be able to dig down really deeply together into some of the issues. So what I did, was bring in two uh, highly respected and highly accomplished colleagues of mine, uh, Patrick, Patrick Miller, who's a professor of philosophy at Duquesne, you can see there, uh, and John Bova, who's the other visiting faculty in the seminar. He's a researcher in philosophy at the University of New Mexico. Uh, in addition, uh, Shah is joining us. Shah is a PhD candidate in quantitative psychology and economics at the University of Warsaw. Shaw, among other things, will be delivering a separate lecture, uh, we'll give you more information on that, uh, about the psychology of intelligence and the ways in which intelligence interacts with economic performance. He'll also be somebody who will help coach you, if you so desire, in some of the deeper mathematical questions surrounding Bayesian reasoning. And Trung uh, serving as our teaching assistant. So Trung, um, as I learned very recently, is at the premier uh, research institute for artificial intelligence in Vietnam. He's an expert in machine learning. And finally, thank God, Matthias is here as our moderator, uh, organizing things and making 50 people uh, thrown all the way around the globe get together to, to do this uh, together. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about 
how the seminar is being organized, how this time will flow for us. It will happen, will sort of pass so quickly, you won't even realize that you'll enjoy it so much. Um, what we'll do is uh, we'll have sort of four parts um, uh, to each seminar. So the first hour or so uh, uh, from 2 p.m. to 3 p.m. Pittsburgh time uh, will be a sort of lecture by myself, uh, introducing the ideas that we have in play. So talking about some of the concepts, some of the ideas the readings have brought up, putting them into some larger context and maybe establishing an account of intelligence that we were promised in the synopsis. Um, after I finish that, uh, we'll have a coffee and sherry break. Sherry, if it's evening, your time. Um, and you know, we'll get some coffee, we'll wake up. Um, we'll also do a little Q&A. So after my tea gets poured, we can chat um, and you can ask questions about that. Um, then after that, John Bova will produce some kind of response. John and I are not quite sure what's gonna happen when he does this, but uh, John will produce a response in a kind of Socratic fashion. So I get to be the sophist. John then comes in and he says, don't you truly mean Simon X? Um, so he'll, he'll destroy me utterly. Then we will, I will delete the computer. I will delete the Zoom. And the last 45 minutes of our seminar each week will be breakout discussions led by myself, uh, Patrick Miller and John Bova separately. So then we'll gather together in smaller groups uh, to talk about the ideas, the readings, to debate some of the questions or to go beyond them into, into new directions. So uh, that's what things will look like um, from Sunday to Sunday. Uh, let's begin. So the big concept or the big idea that I wanna get across today is the idea that we can look at intelligence in two distinct ways. We can see intelligence as a tool or a faculty on the one hand, and we can see intelligence as a process on the other. This is like almost like a figure ground reversal, right? We can say that the, the ape or the lion are intelligent. They have the faculty of intelligence. They're cunning creatures. And at the same time, we can say that they participate in some kind of intelligent process that might exist, let's say at the level of an ecosystem. Um, if we see, and perhaps this is the easier way to see it, if we see um, intelligence as a faculty, we, we see it as something like, let's say, like being intelligent is like having a keen eyesight, right? In this case, intelligence is something that exists for another, and in particular, that exists for a subject, for a person informally, right? So this is familiar. So when you were young, perhaps your grandmother said of you, if you're taking this class, I'm sure your grandmother said of you this, if you happen to know your grandmother, uh, you know, she'd say like, oh, you're so smart in the same way that she might've said, you're so strong when you picked up something big. Uh, your grandmother wasn't the first person to notice this. People noticed the existence of this faculty of intelligence early on, that just as there were strong people or courageous people, there were also smart people, right? People with some kind of ability that couldn't necessarily be located directly in the body, right? It's not something that exists in your muscles, in your face, in your voice, but it's a faculty that seems to attach to your being in some way, your own personal soul. In the Western tradition, if we look at the prehistory of this intuition, uh, we come across the notion, at least in Greek, of mitis. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, Patrick, but mitis, uh, which can be translated as wily or cunning and whose exemplar is Odysseus, the hero beloved of Athena. Uh, but also in the mythological tradition by a less well-known character called Antilochus, who appears in the Iliad. Um, Odysseus's tricks, wily Odysseus, um, uh, the ways in which he uses his intelligence, his cunning to get himself home, not his shipmates in the end, but at least he himself home. These are pretty well known to us. Uh, Antilochus, however, is perhaps a better example of the complexity or the social complexity, the moral complexity of the concept of this faculty of intelligence. So let me tell you a little bit about who Antilochus is. Um, and what's going on when he's portrayed in the Western tradition as somebody with this metistic faculty, right? So who is he? Antilochus is in the Iliad, not the Odyssey. And he's one of the men who uh, are to participate in a chariot race. He's a young man, however, and he doesn't have the money or the social power to get fast horses, right? So he's gonna be in this chariot race, but his horses aren't particularly fast. His chariot's not particularly well balanced. And he's outgunned, as it were, by older and more established men who he's going to race against, most notably Menelaus, the king of Sparta, the kind of cuckolded husband of Helen himself. 
So uh, Antilochus has got a father and his father is Nestor, wise and cunning, Nestor. And what Nestor does is he scouts the racetrack ahead of time before this race takes place. And Nestor helps his son conceive a plan. And he says, look, there's this narrow curve at one point in the course. And if you, Antilochus, are clever, what you can do is kind of swerve obliquely around the other racers, kind of cut them off. And uh, you know, if you pretend to be somewhat wild and out of control, perhaps what this will do is enable you to gain the lead. So exactly what happens, uh, what exactly the trick in the book is, is a bit tricky because if you, if you read this, this passage in the Iliad, it appears that Nestor is coming up with a trick that uh, Antilochus doesn't use, he uses a different trick, but in the end, some kind of trickery happens, some kind of cunning move happens in the course of this NASCAR uh, chariot race and Antilochus wins. Uh, in doing so, he demonstrates this key attribute of Metis, which is not just the ability to win the race, right? Not just intelligence as utility, intelligence as winning, rationality as winning, as Yudkowsky would say, but the, the ability to win against the natural order of things. So success in this earlier conception of intelligence, success can be gained in two ways. The first way you gain success is through natural superiority, meaning you have fast horses, right? Your physical, your material properties are matched to the natural world in such a way that you just win. So this reminds me, there's a really dumb old joke uh, that we used to tell. It's like one of these internet atheist jokes. And so, you know, they ask, um, they ask these three people, what's the greatest invention of all time, right? So the physicist says, oh, you know, the greatest invention is like the semiconductor. And the biologist says, you know, the greatest invention is, you know, CRISPR. And then they ask this psychic and they, you know, the psychic says, well, the greatest invention is the thermos. And they say, well, why is the thermos the greatest invention? And the psychic says, well, think about it, right? The, the thermos keeps hot liquids hot and it keeps cold liquids cold. And everyone's like, yeah, so? And he says, but how does the thermos know, right? Like this thermos is a genius. How does it know to keep the hot things hot and the cold things cold? So the joke is of course, like there's nothing intelligent about that. That's just the natural order of things, right? But the flip side, the metis, the cunning source of intelligence is a, is a victory or a success that comes uh, through, and I'll use this quote, this is a line from one of the early scholars of Metis, the, uh, the idea of the use of methods of a different order, whose effect is to overturn the natural and expected outcome. So the faculty of intelligence is to win when you're not supposed to, when sort of the odds are in some way against you, when the natural order, the natural uh, progress of things is supposedly to make you lose, to frustrate you. So interestingly, one of the uh, characters in the Odyssey who is given this, this characteristic of Metis, not just Odysseus, but also actually Helen of Troy, who we meet in the Odyssey again. And Helen of Troy is somebody who has to, of course, win despite the natural order of things that places women in some sort of permanent losing position vis-a-vis -vis men. Um, one way to see the complexity or the ambiguity of the response to Metis, right? The, the response to this faculty that enables you to, to bouleverse to, to sort of flip the order of things is to look at what the outcome of the race is. So Antilochus wins the race, he passes the, the finish line first and Menelaus, the king is outraged by this behavior and he forces Antilochus to apologize and abase himself. But then interestingly, having done so, he's like, okay, fine, here, have the horse, well done. Right? So there's this ambiguity in the Greek tradition that in fact, Neil Stevenson points out in Cryptonomicon many years later, that there's Metis, even though on the one hand, you might expect some faculty that enables you to you know, overturn the natural order is something that we should, that would be disrespected, would be a matter of concern is also in a way beginning to be honored. So the story of Metis, the story of Antilochus in the Iliad is not just an example of this faculty notion of intelligence, but also starts to get at the kind of ambiguity that intelligence as faculty has for us. So uh, this is our first example of intelligence. It's our first example of intelligence as faculty. Odysseus will demonstrate it over and over again, overcoming the stronger, uh, not by natural capacity, but by deploying a set of skills that are oblique to the problem. Uh, in the case of the Odyssey, it's not just Helen being able to delay the suitors. It's not just Helen actually messing with people when they're sitting in the belly of the horse itself. Uh, but of course, it's also in, uh, in the case of Odysseus when he's able to outwit an extraordinarily strong uh, murderous agent like the Cyclops. 
uh, there's kind of an interesting pun uh, in that part of the Ili or in the, that part of the Odyssey, sorry, where the word nobody, which in Greek is utes, is is pun potentially with metis itself. So when um, Odysseus tells the Cyclops, "I am nobody," in a sense, he's also telling them, "Like I am cunning." So that's that's the first notion. What I've done there is just tease apart a little bit what your grandmother might have meant. You know, she sort of said, "Ah, you're so smart." Right? Um, there's a sort of more mysterious notion at first. And that's the second way of viewing intelligence as a process. Uh, we see intelligence as a phenomenon in the world itself, disassociated from a subject. So this is what happens. We have this notion of intelligence um, when we talk about the emergence of intelligent life. Right? I have colleagues who work on you know, getting NASA to fund you know, research into the possibility of intelligent life on other planets. Uh, when, you know, in Star Trek, when Spock scans the surface of the alien planet, uh, or when we look at, you know, an image like this here that should be animating on your screen right now, the cellular automata, Conway's game of life. When we look at this, I'm just looking at myself, when we look at this, right, there's something like all these little sort of propagating things with some kind of patterns to them. Actually, you'll see what happens. We zoom out quickly enough here. You'll see that this is actually a process that's instantiating itself. So we zoom out far enough and you'll see the game of life is actually running a copy of the game of life. So when we look at this, right, we have a feeling there's, there's something smart going on here. There's something intelligent sitting inside this process. And I, yet I haven't told you who's overcoming who, where's the chariot race, right? Where's the cyclops? How, is, how are these little particles escape? There's not even a question here. This is a second intuition, however, that there's something intelligent going on. This is the same sort of sense, the same smell of intelligence that we get when we, for example, potentially listen to a complex piece of music like Bach or Charlie Parker, uh, the way we might say, oh, that's an intelligent discussion, even if we don't quite know what the goals of the discussion actually are. So in this case, in this second view of intelligence, intelligence becomes a phenomenon divorced from subjectivity divorced from the kind of struggle between you know, the underdog, Antilochus, the natural winner, Menelaus. Right? Um, there's something, there's a different notion that we have in play here. And partly what this first seminar is about is about the tension between those two possibilities or those two ways of viewing it. If I were to lay out the two perspectives onto the Sunday seminars we have together, it would look like this, right? Today, intelligence as utility is the view of intelligence as a faculty. Next week, intelligence as computation will be this kind of process-oriented account. So um, if we were ancient Greeks, we could keep these two things separate, I would say, right? So we can say, hey, you remember Antilochus? Like this is this kind of cunning. And then, I don't know, we could you know, get an iPad and show this to Socrates and be like, isn't this blowing your mind right now? Like, look at this, there's clearly something intelligent here, don't you think? Um, but we, as sort of modern people, for better or for worse, these things are mixed together. Intelligence as faculty and intelligence as process are mixed together. And the reason for this, the blame for this confusion, I would say, goes back as it often does in philosophy to Descartes. So let's touch on this now. What, will, what happened in a sense, what happened to the, you know, the Western at least investigation of intelligence is that a discovery in mathematics, a very abstract, useful discovery in mathematics brought a new notion of intelligence into being. So I'm gonna give you the cartooniest of cartooniest sketches of what Descartes did. Uh, this is something that may be familiar to you if you cast your mind back to sort of high school geometry, right? So here's the Cartesian discovery, right? Um, on the left-hand side of the screen here, you have geometric figures. I've just drawn some circles and ellipses and, and lines. Um, these are things, let's say, these are things that exist in the world. They're real things. They're not necessarily physical objects that you can hit your head on, but they're, you know, some real abstract, unchanging objects of which we see but shadows and so forth, right? And we can reason about these. We can actually use our mind, we can use our intelligence to make sense of what these objects are doing, the relationships between them, the relationships between their properties. What Descartes showed in the 1600s was that there was in fact a new way to deal with this reality. What you could do is take this real world, you could take this, this geometric scenario and map it into an abstract world of syntactical objects. You can map or transform or re-represent these figures 
in a new symbolic system, which we call algebra, right? So the symbols on the right-hand side of the screen here, right? These are things like X squared plus Y squared equals R squared. Maybe you were taught at some point, this is a circle. In one sense, of course, it is a circle, but what we've done is transform this real object in the world into a symbolic language that we can then manipulate purely syntactically, meaning we don't actually have to know what these symbols mean in some sense. We don't have to have some relationship of meaning to them. We just know the rules by which they're associated and we can get things done, right? So the X's and the Y's, they're these sort of computer-like rule-based prescriptions that don't require you to have any contact with reality. Magically, however, by this sort of purely mindless processing of information, by this sort of rearrangement of terms according to a set of actually rules so simple you can program them into a computer, you could derive conclusions about the real phenomenon on the left. So you kind of grind away, a like squiggly line grind away, and you say, oh, lo and behold, I've re-represented these circles and lines with these algebraic formula. And when I manipulate those formula according to a set of rules, I discover, let's say, b squared minus 4ac equals zero. And from that, I can actually now derive a claim about the world, a claim about these real geometric objects, and in particular, the claim that the line is tangent to the circle, right? And what I've done here, I've sort of taken this liberty of adding an arrow back to the real to indicate that the process terminates in some claim, right? Some claim about things that actually exist. So once we have this framework in place, we have metaphorically, right, a new definition or a new image, a new account of intelligence, right? If metis was the ability, right, the faculty to judge a scenario and produce an effective and sort of unnatural outcome, we know it's there because the person who shouldn't have won, won. The Cartesian picture now has this sort of explanation for what happens, right? So we have a scenario, right? I got to run this race. Um, the, you know, in the Iliad, in the Odyssey, right, the scenario is resolved by some clever action. But the Cartesian picture actually allows us to account for it or produces an explanation for this, which says that Metis is actually nothing but this sort of process, this back channel process by which we turn the real world into some set of syntactic counters, right? Some set of, you know, kind of jumbled up pieces that we then through squiggly lines manipulate according to a set of rules and out the other side get some kind of prescription for action. And so now you start to get a sense of how someone could believe that like a cellular automaton, some kind of rule-based system could be intelligent, even if it, you know, there's unclear how it could squeak out a win in that chariot race, right? Or escape the cyclops. It's the idea fundamentally that the left and the right arrows, the arrows taken from the left column to the right and back, those are kind of trivial, right? That's just a matter of muscle, right? And the squiggly line is where the cunning truly lies, right? Metis is actually in transformations on these syntactic representations. So today this, and you know, depending on you know, whether you have a, a degree in computer science, right? This may be completely obvious to you, right? Clearly what's happening in Odysseus is that what he's done is take the scenario, represent it to himself in some way, process it in some clever and intelligent way. And all of the intelligence is in that wiggly line there, right? The premium is placed on the line going from top to bottom. And that premium today is so extreme that it's led, I would say, led to this kind of society-wide illusion. There's this illusion, a kind of blindness, this optical illusion that we have a great difficulty seeing through, right? We have forgotten, I would claim, metis in the original sense, and we've become so enamored of process that we don't see it any other way. Um, here's just an example of pure syntax, like how this has taken over our view. This is a game, I don't know if anyone's ever had this actually, I just took a picture of it. This is a game called Whiff and Proof, Well-Formed Formula and Proof. So I'll just hang these up. These are, this is like the world's worst game, right? So it's these dice, you get these dice, and I'll hold one up to the screen. You can see them, but these dice have uh, little logical symbols on them. And the game is, you know, you and your friends sit around, you roll the symbols and the dice come up a certain way. And then you have a timer, right? You flip the timer and everybody has to then create as quickly as possible a set of well-formed formula, which is just a logical notion, right? They have to create, using these symbols, create the longest logical formula that obeys the syntactical rules of logic. Um, so I asked this, I posted years ago on Twitter, who else remembers this game? And it turns out like a lot of friends of mine who are now faculty, right? Their parents bought them this game. 
what this game is meant to do secretly is make you more intelligent get you better at the symbol manipulation that we consider to be central to the process of being a smart person. So um, where does this go wrong, right? Where, you know, where are we losing Mitis? Well, one answer is like, let's go to the opening question that I gave to you guys uh, on the form, right? So uh, the, for this question, I said, look, your friend tosses a coin 10 times. It comes up heads 10 times in a row, what is the probability that the coin will come up heads on the 11th toss? So about 60% of you, uh, we had 45 responses in the end, about 60% of you said that the probability that the coin comes up heads on the 11th toss is 50-50. Right? Um, to be clear, right, that's absolutely, I would say that's absolutely insane if you took this question as a serious question about the world, right? So I want you to think about this. Imagine you've got a friend, right, tosses the coin once, heads, again, heads, again, heads, he tosses the coin 10 times. Uh, if you take off the glasses that you've been forced to wear when you usually answer these questions, right? You realize that if somebody tosses a coin 10 times and it comes up heads 10 times in a row, something is going on, something weird is going on and you are definitely not in a situation where there's a fair coin, right? Um, you know instantly, if you were to imagine this actually happening, you know instantly that something funny is going on, that of course the coin is not fair. Of course, you're at least starting to become very likely that you're being tricked. The real intelligent question at this point is, how am I being tricked? To what end am I being tricked? And if you really want to be cunning, how can I outwit this person who for some reason has had me stand in front of them and toss a coin 10 times and get heads 10 times? So, um, I was sort of wondering psychoanalytically, right? Why, why do people answer 50-50? Um, you know, one answer is, well, I can't possibly conceive of a situation in which I'm being tricked. I don't think that's the case. I think everybody who answered 50-50 here is completely aware that sometimes people you know, try to trick each other. Sometimes people set up a game that's not fair, that three card Monte is not always, you know, fairly played. Um, but you're answering that question in part because you've been so trained to answer questions of this sort according to a certain script, a certain set of symbolic manipulations that we know from high school probability theory that says, ah, you know, a fair coin sort of tossed independently. So when you read this phrase, your friend tosses a coin 10 times, you're not actually imagining a real world scenario in which somebody is literally standing in front of you tossing a coin. You've already transposed it to the right hand column. And you already agree that you're not actually in the reality world anymore. You're in this kind of syntactic world where different pieces with different pieces of information are going to be combined according to a set of rules. Um, so it's a question why, you know, why would you answer this question 50-50? One answer, you know, and to be clear, why would you answer, when I phrase this question to you, why would you answer it 50-50? Um, one is, this is the answer you're meant to give, right? Simon is some kind of professor and look, I know the rules of this game. The rules of this game are don't, you know, a coin's independent, gamblers ruin, this sort of thing. Um, one thing that strikes me is that there's a kind of trauma involved in questions of this sort. So uh, take somebody who is uh, who has intelligence as a faculty, right? Uh, let's imagine, for example, that they're a bright young kid in a bad school, and that bright young kid's in a bad school, and he's given this question on an application for the accelerated honors program. It's going to get him out of this bad school and going to get him into a classroom where like Patrick and John are going to teach him, right? So he's sitting there and he's like, I've got to answer this question. And so he actually has to take two steps. The first step is he has to say, well, obviously, being somebody of reasonable intelligence, I know that if a coin is tossed 10 times and it comes up heads 10 times in a row, then obviously something's going on. But then, okay, I have to be sort of even more tricky and cunning and realize that actually this, this question is designed to test not how I would behave or how I would actually act in the world intelligently, but whether or not I can reproduce a set of fundamentally fake manipulations that we associate with intelligence. So there's some kind of, some very strange mind fuckery going on here. Um, I was in a conversation a few days ago with somebody who teaches people how to pass the LSAT. And he says, actually, look, the LSAT's a really easy test. All you have to do is realize that you've been completely traumatized by all the kinds of fake questions that you're being asked to solve over and over again. You just answer the questions as if you were a normal, intelligent person. Uh, the main problem here is to show people, in fact, the ways in which that their intelligence has been manipulated almost without them knowing. So that's the first step, or at least the first step in this argument is to say, look, here's an, a classic example 
right? That seems to settle the question. If the Cartesian answer, the answer you give if you do the kind of bog standard abstract representation uh, that dictated to you by the arbiters of these things, if the Cartesian answer leads you to be tricked by a more cunning adversary, then surely the whole picture is wrong, right? Metis, the thing that any grandmother would see is intelligence, must be the primary concept. And the quality of the process pathway is derivative. A process can't be intelligent, whether or not, you know, it's like a, a, a process can't be intelligent, whether or not it is intelligent versus just like pure turmoil is a matter of outcome. So in the end, fundamentally, the process might get you what you want, but it is not intelligence itself. So that's where we might end. We say, look, there's, you know, this kind of what Taleb would call the IYI, the intellectual yet idiot, right? The person who is so good at the process manipulations that they, you know, continually get tricked by the wily Odysseus with his, you know, biased coin. But the story doesn't quite end there because a century or so after the Cartesian breakthrough came a second one associated with this extraordinary paper published in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society. Um, this is a paper, if you read this, I'll read this. It's uh, the, this is a paper, it's published by the Reverend Bayes. Actually, any academic is extraordinarily jealous because Bayes actually didn't have to publish this paper. He died and somebody just, you know, collected his notes and published it for him, which is I think how every academic would love to publish papers. You just come up with the answers, you write them in your notebooks. And then after you die, somebody assembles them and, you know, you get like the mega citation paper, you know, after you die. Um, so in fact, this is communicated to, um, somebody else, it's, uh, you know, it's an essay towards solving a problem in the doctrine of chances by the late Reverend Bayes, communicated by Mr. Price in a letter to John Canton, fellow of the Royal Society. Dear sir, I now send you an essay which I have found among the papers of our deceased friend, Mr. Bayes, and which in my opinion has great merit and well deserves to be preserved, no joke. Um, the paper is fundamentally about producing a reliable method for syntactic reasoning that matches reality to representation, that transforms those representations according to, again, purely syntactic rules, and for producing out the other side a system of recommendations that in some important sense are guaranteed to be correct. They're guaranteed to be consistent. Now, Bayes couldn't have known the details of all these proofs. They came much later in the 20th century, but the method that he lays out here, if you follow it to its conclusion, will produce not just a Con, uh, not just a consistent set of reasons, but also in an important way, an optimal set of reasons. Uh, every judicious person, as the introduction says, every judicious person will be sensible that the problem mentioned, the problems that Bayes is trying to solve here, are by no means merely a curious speculation on the doctrine of chances, meaning probability, but necessary to be solved in order to assure, in order to solve, or in order to ensure a sure foundation for all our reasonings concerning past facts, and what is likely to be hereafter. So uh, the promise of Bayesian reasoning is to somehow take the symbolic pathway, show you how to use that symbolic pathway in a way that will be guaranteed to get you what you want, that will in some sense be optimal, that will have the optimal, the most cunning uh, solution possible. So here's how this would work if we ran through the Bayesian version of this problem. So some of you may have answered the problem that way, right? Some of you are sort of traumatized. I won't be tricked by the coin tossing thing. I know coins are always independent, uh, but some of you may have done this uh, slightly more involved process. Right? So we sort of have, let's to be clear, we have sort of three things in play. Like one answer is 50-50 because you know, sort of teacher says so, and we know that's what you have to answer. The second thing is, well, let me think this through, right? If I'm actually on the street in New York and a guy tosses a coin 10 times, I got to figure out what to do next. Clearly the one thing I know is that it's not 50-50. And then there's this third process that gets sort of nerds like myself and perhaps you very excited. So here's the Bayesian analysis of that same puzzle. We have sort of two theories now, let's say of the world. We have the theory that the coin is fair. It's 50-50 heads versus tail. And then we have this other possibility, right? The possibility that there's some scam going on, right? The person's running a scam on you. And what the scam theory is gonna do is say, okay, and the scam theory is many different possibilities for that scam theory, but one is look, the coin is super biased, 99% heads to 1% tails. Like the guy is somehow really good at tossing it in a funny way to get uh, heads every time he wants. So what the Bayesian method tells you how to do 
is how to reason about this scenario to say which of these two cases is more likely, right? Which of these is the, you know, what does the track look like when we're gonna race together our chariots? What's that track look like? Is it a fair track or is it a scam track? So, um, and I'll read this, I'll sort of talk you through this a little bit here. Um, on the left-hand side is the thing we wanna know. We wanna know the probability or the degree of belief I should assign to the possibility that this coin is truly a fair coin given the scenario I've seen so far. So I wanna know like, given what I've seen, how likely is it that this coin actually is a truly fair coin? And what the Bayesian method does is tell you, okay, this thing here, you don't know how to reason this out at the beginning before this paper was published in the 1700s. No one knew how to calculate this, didn't really know they ought to, right? But it turns out that this thing here that you wanna know, this crucial bit of information is encoded in a set of terms that you actually can estimate. So the first term here is the probability that you would have gotten what you've seen so far, given that the coin is fair, right? So this thing here says, look, if the coin was fair, how likely would it be to get what I saw? Times this thing here called a prior, which is the degree of belief I have that this coin is fair in the first place. And then divided by this kind of nuisance term here, the probability of the scenario overall. So I have this, I can calculate here using these three terms here, things that I can actually just crunch through a little bit like these dice, right? I can actually crunch through without any real regard for what's actually going on. And I can also crunch through the second possibility. Given what I've seen so far, what's the chance that someone's running a scam on me? I can compute those two numbers. And then out the other side, I get a uh, consistent, the optimal best derived belief about which of these two is more likely, the probability or the degree of belief I should have that the coin is fair versus the degree of belief I should have that the coin is actually a scam. So let's take a look, let's go back to the answers that people gave. And now let's imagine that all of you were Bayesians, right? So everybody answering this question was, uh, uh, had the same mental model of the world that in this case, and I made this a little simpler here, that on the one hand, the coin is fair or possibly that the coin is a scam. And so uh, given these two possibilities, who could have answered that the coin was 50-50? The only people in this case who could have so answered are those who believe that the possibility of a scam was actually zero, that it was literally impossible that I would be scammed. So in this case, under this view, the, you know, the people who answer 50-50, if they're Bayesians, are like the world's most naive people, right? They are not necessarily like clever people trying to get into the advanced probability class, right? Trying to, you know, trick the IQ test. They're literally just honest people grinding away who believe that the probability of a scam is zero. Um, then you have people here, right? So I just ran the numbers. Um, so some of you answered, I guess three of you said, oh, you know what? It's 80% likely to be heads. So what would that mean if you were a Bayesian? Um, if, you know, you said, okay, I've seen the coin get tossed 10 times. Well, the only free variable at this point is the prior probabilities, the extent to which you think coming into the scenario that the coin is fair versus the coin is a scam. Right? And if after 10 tosses, you think that the coin is gonna come up heads with 80% likelihood on the 11th toss, essentially I can sort of reverse engineer your beliefs. And we do this all the time when we try and model people from their behavior, reverse engineer your beliefs and say, okay, look, you're, you know, you're not naive, but you're a pretty trusting person. You think the chance that if you run into somebody who tosses a coin 10 times in front of you, right, is like, you know, 0.5% is a scam, right? 99.5% of the time, you think that actually it's just an honest thing, like somebody for some bizarre reason is tossing a coin in front of you, right? And uh, it's actually just a fair game. So that's a person we can locate, or we can now sort of back out the beliefs the person has. Uh, what I really love about this actually is that um, the correct answer, I'm not quite sure what the truly correct answer is because I've never been in this situation. I, you know, there's, they haven't written a book about it, but probably the best answers that I can see or the most cunning answers are the ones that say that the probability of the coin coming up heads on the 11th toss is less than 50-50, right? So what's really going on here, of course, is this person has a theory about the world where you, know, you run into a guy on the street, he tosses a coin 10 times, right? And of course, what he's trying to do is induce you to place a bet that the coin will be heads again. And because he's so clever, right? He's gonna toss it that 11th time and be like, oh, done. 
I don't know if anyone's ever been gulled by Free Hard Monty. I wasn't, but a friend of mine was. And this is, of course, the game they play, right? They set up a situation in which it looks extraordinarily predictable. They play it over and over again. They let you win a little money, right? They let you think that you've gotten an edge, that you know, you've actually figured out, ah, oh, the coin's a scam. I know how this works. I'm going to win. And then, of course, on the 11th toss, you've now bet everything and you've lost all your money. They quickly hustle the table out around the corner because the cops are there. So probably the wisest or the most, you know, cunning, the most wily answer comes from people who answer down here way on this side, on, on, over here. Um, a few other points, since we're reverse engineering people here, a few other points, it's interesting. So three people answered it was 100% likely. If you do the reading, you realize that 100% likely is a very crazy thing to say, because if you say something is um, probable with probability one under the Bayesian case, you mean that it's logically impossible for the coin to do anything but come up heads? Somebody also put a zero down here. If you're a Bayesian, assigning zero probability means that it is logically impossible for the coin to come up tails. It's unclear what logical impossibility would mean when it applies to a physical scenario. Um, my guess is that people who put zero are, or the person who put zero, people who put these really, really small numbers are saying essentially like, no, I know what's going on. There's a trick. That coin is going to be flipped onto tails the next time around. So um, this, this method of reasoning, um, if you kind of look at how it represents thought, it's actually quite fun. So people get addicted to Bayesian reasoning. They get addicted for two reasons. One is, is that it promises a, an optimal way to do that kind of squiggly line. Once you've mapped to the right-hand column, if, and of course this is the key, if, if these priors are set up correctly, so if you have the right model space of fair and scam and scam one and scam two, and you've correctly calibrated those priors, you will in fact win, the, you will have the best possible win that anybody could have. Like you have your nester whispering in your ear in the optimal possible way. Um, there's something else that's quite fun about this. If you look at how these equations represent thought, so you actually watch them, as the, you watch these different terms as they multiply together, they seem to correspond in a funny way to a very slow motion sort of forward running of a very reasonable sort of tediously reasonable person, right? So, you know, you imagine walking through the fair scam thing, right? So they do the first, they do the first term here. Well, what's the probability that, you know, this coin is truly fair? Well, I guess first term, I guess it's really unlikely that if the coin was fair, this would happen. And then you're like, well, and I guess, you know, the thing is, though, that it's, you know, not, in, you know, it's pretty likely the coins are fair to begin with. So, you know, even though it's really unlikely, like, I'm not going to, you know, this, this number here is going to be closer to one. And then you say, well, like, what else could have happened? And this is the bottom term. It's always the weirdest one. Well, you know, like, maybe in all the models that I can think of, things are unlikely. Like, I'm just in a weird world right now. Things are weird. It's like Sunday morning, something weird is going on. I'm not sure. And so even though this thing here is low and this doesn't really compensate, like the world's so weird that I'm gonna make this low. So you got a small thing divided by a small thing and then you know this is still okay, right? Sort of walking very slowly. When you get used to this, right? It's a little like, uh, I would say it's a little like reading about wine while drinking wine, right? You know, so you, you imagine yourself reasoning and then at the same time you're drinking wine, it's like, hi, don't you see the notes, right? The notes of charcoal, pencil and fatty salmon. So in fact, actually we do this in psychology these days. Um, so here are two of the greats in what's called uh, the Bayesian revolution, Tom Griffiths and Josh Tannenbaum. And uh, so they often write these really beautiful papers where uh, they'll produce these plots. So here's just a plot from the paper. Don't worry, there's no math in the class, right? Um, here's the plot, right? So, you know, on the blue here, these are these kind of qualia of reason, right? So in this case, they put people into simulations. They put people into simulated environments where maybe there's conspiracies going on or not. And they're kind of evaluating whether people see the events in the simulation as like mere coincidence or suspicious coincidence or really like evidence in favor that I'm living in a kind of bizarre world. So there's the qualia of reason, the qualia of intelligent reasoning. And what they do is then map these against the Bayesian quantities, right? So these kind of mathematical representations. And so in fact, they're doing this kind of beautiful thing where they go from scenario, they map the scenario to uh, this idealized universe of reason. They grind through and then they keep in parallel the idealized version of that grinding along with people's reports of the actual experiences they have of producing reasons. So I think it's quite gorgeous. I think that's actually really charming about this paper is that the simulated conspiracy scenarios they're setting up are based on a, a, a story in Gravity's Rainbow, right? So they have um, 
they're showing, they show maps of London. You remember this from Gravity's Rainbow if you ever read it. They show maps of London and where bombs have fallen and they make the bombs sort of cluster or not in suspicious ways. Uh, so in fact, they're actually reproducing how people reason about, in this case, insane conspiracy theoretic worlds. So um, this finally, I would say, brings us around to the Yudkowsky reading that I had you guys do today. So um, here's what we have um, in the Cartesian picture to begin with. We have this question, okay, I'm in some scenario, how do I win? This is Metis, right? We have this process view, right? Where we take the scenario, map it to some syntactic representation, like an algebraic representation, right? We grind through that syntactic representation. We come out the other side with a transformed syntax that we then map back to the left-hand column, enabling us to then make an intelligent decision. In as much as we're intelligent, it's in as much as this blue process here is intelligent. If we say the left to right transition is kind of trivial, then really intelligence relies here on pure manipulation of form, in which case now intelligence could be just as well forms continuously manipulated without any real outcome, right? That's the magic is sitting here. The Bayesian model is even more compelling because it says, okay, whatever we're actually doing, whatever kind of syntactic transformations might be going on in our head, we now have an ideal system. We take our syntactic representation, whatever you know, thoughts and beliefs we have, we map it to the Bayesian prescription. We manipulate that Bayesian prescription in the correct way. And out the other side, we are in some important way guaranteed to produce clever action. So this is the promise, right? The way to sort of rescue the kind of the, the process uh, representation of intelligence to say, ah, look, it may at the beginning, it may be the case that, oh, process failed. So that intelligence can't be processed because sometimes the process fails. And really we have to go back to this earlier, more primitive notion of intelligence as winning. Ah, not so fast because we can actually guarantee a process that's ideal, that will produce the optimal outcome. And so now we've rescued the process account from this kind of skepticism you might have. So this, as I said, brings us to the Yukowski reading. Um, uh, here's how Yukowski, how he sees this world, right? Um, and at least in these, this series of deeply passionate posts um, that he's written on the question. So I should say, be, before we talk a little bit about how Yukowski sees the world and how you guys see the world, I'll tell you how I see the world on this. I'll tell you how I see Newcomb's problem, Newcomb's paradox. Um, the first thing is that Newcomb's paradox is in some sense a fake narrative. It's a story that's underdetermined. It's a story onto which we project all sorts of fantasies and beliefs and stories. Uh, whether you're a one boxer or a two boxer is really fundamentally about a story you wanna tell about the world. Uh, if I recall correctly, um, Martin Gardner posed this, this problem in one of his famous columns. And Isaac Asimov said, you know, hey, Martin, you know what I do? I, I, I'm a two boxer. I take both boxes and Martin's why. And Isaac Asimov's like, well, you know, fuck you, God, right? Um, you know, you, you can't predict me, eat it, right? Um, so, uh, you know, this is really a projection screen upon which we show the world how we actually see things, the metaphysics, the ontology, the way we think actually work. It's actually underdetermined. Um, I, there's so many papers written about Newcomb's paradox that if I even, you know, I couldn't even tell you the number because there's so many digits, the class would be over by the time I finished reading you the number of digits and the number of how many papers are written. Uh, I'm a fan, Gregory Benford, um, the science fiction author and David Wolpert, a colleague of mine at the Santa Fe Institute wrote what I would say is the best version of this, uh, the best sort of debunking or un un unraveling of the paradox, which says, look, if you take Newcomb's paradox, if you take the Newcomb problem as purely a game theory problem and you just make it play the rules of von Neumann game theory, then out the other side, like you realize it's underdetermined, there's a certain move, there's a certain statement that says it's unclear whether it should be, you know, the probability is zero conditional upon this or conditional upon that. Once you realize that, the problem breaks and depending upon which fork of the break you take, you're either a one boxer or a two boxer. Anyway, that's, that's um, David Wolpert and Gregory Benford's solution. Uh, the Simon version of this, and I think this is, I, I won't tell you how to solve the problem, but the reason it's a paradox or the reason it's distressing, particularly for, you know, Cartesian process oriented types is because what it does is it takes two things that are usually in strict consonance. So the technical terms are maximize expected utility on the one hand 
and the principle of uh, strict dominance. Usually these two principles tell you to do the same thing. Newcomb's paradox splits them. And so now if you follow recommendation one, you're one boxer, you follow recommendation two, you're a two boxer. Um, they usually are in sympathy, like we've produced a world, we've produced a story in which fundamentally they are not in some way. And then the question is how do you navigate that failure of the world to align with something that you've been taught or that you can sort of grind through. So I think when, when uh, David and Gregory are, are solving this problem, that's exactly what, they, what they're pointing out is under the axioms of game three, you don't even need axioms, right? Just sort of mathematically, these two criteria should not be in conflict, they are. So there's something mysterious going on and I will then, they will show you, ah, okay, there's an ambiguity. If you resolve the ambiguity, they are in consonance once again, and they can be in consonance of one of two ways. That consonance tells you to either be a one boxer or a two boxer. Um, so in a, in a funny way, right? Uh, the Newcomb's paradox is kind of a meta version of the coin tossing question we had earlier. You're uh, potentially getting the wrong answer for the right reason. Uh, let me show you since I'm sure you're curious. Here's how you guys do this. Here is the class. Um, here's your fellow students. Here's the people that you will, for better or worse, be sharing the next four sessions with. Um, most of you are one boxers. Uh, there's probably more two boxers in the room than there are in the ordinary survey. So Martin Gardner's column, my, my memory is it's five to two. Um, five people are one boxers for every two, two boxers. You guys are maybe a little bit like too tricky. You know, you're like the 50-50 the, the types. Um, of course, somewhat as expected, the one boxers think they're gonna get a million dollars and the two boxers basically think they're gonna get a thousand dollars. There's this very sad group of people uh, and Alex, actually, I didn't even think about this. Alex Ware said, Simon, you forgot, like, when you, when you said, what do you think will happen? You forgot about the possibility that you get nothing. So there's like a small fraction of people in the class who think like, I'm being good. I'm just taking one box. And yet the box is empty. Like, I, I, I so wanted the thing. And yet and I, I did everything I was meant to. And the world is going to betray me. Um, one, I think it's quite beautiful. I've never, it never occurred to me that there would be this, I'll get nothing option that some people would think this could happen. Um, the other critical question, of course, is how sure are you, right? Do you really, how, do you really feel lucky, right? Um, and so we can change the question. Instead of saying there's a thousand dollars in that transparent box, we say, okay, there's 25 cents, right? There's 25 cents in the box. Yeah, how, how smart are you now, right? And, you know, some of those two boxers convert, right? They're like, million dollars, like, am I really sure that I've gotten the reasoning process right? Well, okay, I'm gonna switch over, right? So then they switch over to the one box case and presumably they switch over to the one box case because they expect to get a million dollars off the other side. So there's something really odd going on here that is revealed, I think right away. Uh, the two boxers, the people who say they would choose two boxes also know that they're gonna get a thousand dollars, that they're missing out in some way simply by virtue of being the two boxes. So how does Yukowski, what's, what's going on in these kind of anguish series of posts that I had you read, right? Um, Yukowski is saying that um, from his point of view, and I, I would disagree with Yukowski's account, he says, look, you know, the smart people, the rational people, they all know to be two boxers. I don't know where he gets this from, but that's, it's in the post. It's like, oh, like, you know, everyone agrees that like the smart, you know, decision theoretic thing is two boxes. I don't, that's not true, right? But that's the impression that he's gotten is like, oh, you know, you people think that, you know, the smart move, the intelligent move here is to be the two boxer, right? And as indeed we can see, you know, in the class here, you two boxers, you're so smart and look what happens, you don't get a million dollars. And so no matter how smart he calls this cognitive ritual is, you're losing. And that can't be intelligence, right? It's impossible to get the wrong answer, right? The, dis the sort of disutility answer for the right reasons. There's no such thing as being sort of intelligently incorrect. The final arbiter of all of this game, the final arbiter of intelligence is never processed. It cannot be processed. It must be in the end, cunning, metis, in the end, it's do you walk away with a million dollars or do you walk away with a thousand? Do you walk away with a million dollars or do you walk away with 25 cents? So I think what's, what's beautiful about these posts is you can see somebody wrestling with exactly this, excuse me, exactly this puzzle here, right? 
where does intelligence truly lie, right? Is it in mitis? Is it in process? Is it even in some kind of ideal process? In the end, Yudkowsky, at least in these series of posts, actually comes down on the side of mitis. Even though um, you may know this, Yudkowsky is part of a very sort of kind of, uh, uh, what's the right word for this? Um, uh, kind of very influential school of thought that says in fact that all human happiness uh, uh, derives fundamentally from correctly following out the idealized ritual of Bayesian calculation. So um, I think one of the reasons perhaps why those blog posts are so beautiful is it's kind of this clash of the Titan scenario, right? Metis versus process. Uh, the final thing I had you guys read, and this is uh, sort of a pleasure of mine, um, also the, you kind of ruined this part of the talk for me with your answers, I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, the final part of this is, oh my God, there's 40 chat messages, Jesus. Okay, I, I can't even handle that. I hope you're having fun. Um, and here's this coda, which is an alternative source 41. Okay, um, I have to hide that for myself. This coda, which is, uh, do many metis make a process, right? Is there some way that people being cunning, right? An intelligence entirely focused on cunning, entirely focused on, you know, getting your chariot around Menelaus at the tight corner because you've, you know, got some insider trading on the, on the course ahead of time from your father, right? This may sound familiar in a metaphorical way. Um, if everyone's doing that, can you actually get a process result, a process intelligence out the other side? So this is this paper uh, that I had you read, the last thing I had you read by uh, Frederick Hayek and the American Economic Review in September, 1945. And this comes at the problem from, in some sense, entirely the back door. In the end, you know, the question for you to decide is, intelligence as faculty versus intelligence as process. Um, in this case, Hayek is coming into a bunch of economists who are convinced that intelligence is indeed process. What they've done, at least from their point of view, is figure out the set of equations that need to be optimized in order to produce a quote unquote rational economic order. And what Hayek points out is that in fact, this calculational process seems nearly impossible. We can certainly specify the abstract, right? The kind of whiff and proof, right? You know, Keynesian way to solve these problems. We can specify the, you know, matrices that you have to diagonalize, the simultaneous equations, the Lagrange multipliers, right? There's an enormous number of process-like papers, the algebra of economics. And yet, and this is perhaps obvious to us now, but Hayek had to point it out, in the end is that that process can't possibly be solved in the way we think it's being solved, right? And the reason is that even if you are able to specify all of the syntactic algebraic manipulations you need to do in order to set up the economy correctly, the data are not given to any individual agent, right? The whole the society as a whole might possess that information, but it does not exist in a single localized place such that the standard notion of calculation could take place. Um, just to give you a sense of this, of how this works, I have an old story. This is a colleague of mine, Sam Bowles, now a very senior economist um, at the Santa Fe Institute. So Sam, and I, I, will, I will tell the story, Sam will maybe testify it or not. Uh, it, it's, let's use it more as a myth than a, than a true account of historical reality. So Sam, back in the day, was a bit of a Marxist. He's a great economist, he's a young man. Ended up in Cuba, and um, you know, as a great economist, as a great sort of you know, highly mathematical economist, the Cuban government asked him, say, you know, hey, can you help us figure out how to build the railways? Because our main trade here is, is sugarcane. So we need to figure out where we put the railways, how many, you know, trains do we allocate to each, each railway to get that sugarcane, you know, to the ports in the right way. We're a planned economy. Let's do this, Sam. And Sam's like, you got it. And here's the technique. It's this method of Lagrange multipliers. And so they sit down, they, they grind. He shows them how to do it. And he's like, great, we'll do it. And he's like, we have all the data. At least they thought they had all the data necessary to do Sam's calculation. And he's like, let's, let's, let's go. And they're like, and this is a kind of beautiful moment. They say, Sam, um, look, we love you. And you know, you're an American, but you're like one of the good guys, you know, you know. But we can't be sure that you're not CIA. So you got to leave the room because now we're going to actually do this calculation. And those Lagrange multipliers, among other things, and they all knew this, Lagrange multipliers not only told you how valuable each line was, but they also told you if you wanted to blow up a railroad, which one would you blow up, right? So it's like, Sam, we trust you, we love you. But just leave the room for that final stage of the calculation, right? So that's the socialist dream, right? It's a dream that 
Um, you know, maybe the, 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 the communist government of Cuba had, it's certainly a dream that, that came up later in the 1960s in Soviet Russia. Um, and it's a dream that in the end um, failed, or it's a dream fundamentally that didn't work. Um, the standard way to do this, or the standard way to show you this is uh, to ask this question, how much should it cost to make a pencil? So, okay, well, how do you do this? Well, you have to figure out all these things, like how much like, should it cost? Well, you, know, you gotta mine the graphite, you gotta press the wood, throw and invent a new pencil making device. Well, you know, I don't know, people need pens more these days, schools are not using pencils so much, uh, but if we, if, you know, a lot of people need pencils, we can fill the ships up more quickly, we can use all this spare capacity, right? Maybe there's pencil makers over here that, you know, that's a part of the world where they're really good at it, right? All this stuff, right? So if you wanted to figure out how much it costs to make a pencil, you'd have this enormous calculational problem to do, which somehow magically gets solved because you and I both know how much it costs to make a pencil within order of magnitude, right? Not precisely, but within order of magnitude, we just go to Amazon, right? And it's about 10 cents, right? A pencil is about 10 cents to make. Now you might say, oh, could it be a dollar? Could it be a penny? Like I was an astronomer, right? You get within an order of magnitude, you're a genius, right? So somehow the free market economy, and this is what Hayek, or what he calls the price mechanism, the free market economy is actually in some bizarre way able to solve this enormous set of simultaneous equations, right? That enables us to allocate effort, where it you know, enables us to direct attention, where we should aid people, where we should help people, what we should care about, what we shouldn't care about, and so forth. Somehow this price signal is able to produce this calculation. And it does so not through like Sam Bowles and the Cuban government sitting around, you know, cranking through a matrix problem to, you know, optimize the, the use of resources, but in fact, just through, excuse me, just through a bunch of, you know, cunning, you know, guys trying to get the edge and, you know, men and women trying to get the edge in any possible way they can, cheating, using their wiles, like all this stuff, trying to do as much as they can. That is actually in some bizarre way, the meatus is, a, is accomplishing a process that no individual could possibly do, right? There's an intelligence in the distributed system that's a process intelligence. It's not a meatus uh, intelligence. If it was, it'd be wonderful. In that case, like, you know, capitalism would work, right? But somehow the meatus is accomplishing a calculation. Um, this paper comes out in 1945, just about the same time. Like this is, you know, the first brick that we needed the second brick comes in like three years later from Claude Shannon and the theory of signals. But fundamentally the problem with the way Hayek rephrased this problem is it turns out that everybody trying to make a buck, roughly speaking, turns into a very intelligent machine. So um, the classic, we've sort of discovered this in different ways. We've put different pieces together, how this could possibly work. Um, and this is the final question I asked you guys. Um, I ask, uh, I do this, I've done this at Indiana, I've done this at Carnegie Mellon, I ask people the same question I asked you, which is guess the weight of my Subaru. I drive a Subaru, it's great ground clearance in Santa Fe. I drive a Subaru, tell me how much does my Subaru weigh? Um, so I do this over and over again, and here's, uh, here's the distribution you'll see. So um, on, this is on my class back in 2019. On the x-axis here, these are the guesses in weight in pounds. So that's 2,000 pounds, 4,000, 6,000, 8,000, 10,000 pounds. Um, the bars here tell you how many people made those guesses. So you can see like someone down here guessed less than 1,000 pounds. Somebody up here guessed 10,000 pounds, right? So you take all these guesses, right? You average those guesses together and you get extraordinarily, bizarrely, spookily close to the right answer. Nobody knows the answer, but when you average all the guesses, they get the answer. Uh, they get the answer almost perfectly correct. So the last time I ran this, the average of all the guesses was 3,288 pounds. Um, the weight of my actual Subaru is 3,593 pounds. And in fact, um, you know, did you guys get, did this class get it right? Well, maybe it's actually, there's a range here. Um, and the range is because I didn't tell you if it was an automatic or manual transmission. So that's the blue band. So you, I do this every year. I do this with my students. And every year you get this bizarre result where there are people who, you know, think a car weighs like a thousand pounds and there are people who think a car weighs 10,000 pounds. You average them together and over and over again, people get it so correct that it's, you know, they basically morally, they got it correct. Um, I was so excited, except it didn't work with you guys. For some reason, okay, I ran this with the new center. You guys have, you guys like, don't get involved in selling cars, right? Because even if I aggregate, you guys got the wrong answer. 
And I'm so disappointed. And I was like, what do I do? I fake the data, right? Like what's the cunning solution here? And I, I just throw myself on your mercy. It didn't work. I don't know why it almost, it's like it's worked five years in a row. Um, the reason it didn't work is that for some reason, nobody guessed high. The highest guess we got was 4,000 pounds. Nobody guessed high. And if you look at this graph, the thing is the person who thinks like gets these insanely high guesses, they actually are the smartest people, right? The person here who's, you know, they, this saves the class, right? Because these people who think a car weighs 10 tons, right? A Subaru weighs 10 tons. They actually drag the average up. You guys are all clustered down here. I tried to save this. I was like, oh, maybe you guys are all European. You're like continental philosophers. So like, what does a car weigh in Europe? And it's like, it's not enough. Like it, somehow you guys are bad at cars. Um, we know a little bit about this. Um, this, what's called wisdom of the crowd's result uh, was first discovered in the 1900s. Um, when there was a game people used to play uh, in um, uh, the uh, in like agricultural fairs, like you know farm fairs that they have in the Midwest. This is in in the UK, and they played the same game except it wasn't guess the weight of the Subaru. It's guess the weight of this ox, and actually the dressed weight, meaning once you take the guts out and the hooves. Uh, and um, what, what Galton did was discover, in fact, that lo and behold, farmers were extraordinarily accurate at making these guesses. Uh, his paper, which was published in Nature, is uh, Vox Populi. Um, so Vox Populi, Vox Dei, Voice of the People, Voice of God. This is somehow sitting in there, somehow what crowds know, right? Crowds, if you have the right method of aggregating, right, you somehow are able to achieve some kind of joint success as a reasoning group. And in fact, again, you guys blew it. I, now I, I can't give this lecture the way I gave it so confidently all these years, because now it didn't work. It didn't work with you guys. Um, but in general, like the idea is that you are able in some way to represent the beliefs of a system as if it were the beliefs of a unitary agent, each of you being some sample of that unitary agent's common belief. So uh, what I've shown there, that curve, this is extracted from the 2019 study I did with my class at CMU. That curve there is in some sense, the common prior over cars. What I've done by asking the class is sample the kind of group mind. The bargain of the Hayakian price mechanism is that if you do this, you have people uh, aggregate their information, you have them aggregated in the right way and you selectively punish those who get it wrong, you can actually achieve some kind of calculation that transcends the ability of any particular agent. So I uh, have ended this, this opening here, hopefully just about on time. Um, I know we ran over a little bit. Um, what I'm gonna do here is put this sort of summary slide up. Uh, it's about 3.08. Let's all get some coffee. So thank you very much for listening to me. Um, Let's get some coffee or get some coffee as you please. We'll come back. Um, I will look at the chat and um, I sort of want to open it up to questions and comments and, and concerns. So I'm going to open the chat now, but please go and make some coffee. Um, and we'll come back. We'll talk about the Q, we'll do some Q&A and then we'll um, go to John. So thanks very much. Thanks, Alan. Just pause it for, for these. So we're open to questions. And perhaps if you also want to, anyone who wants to jump in and, and ask some question or raise your hands and, and yeah, if you, if you guys, if, if people maybe hit the kind of raise hand button there, and then yeah. um, uh, I can just call on people just to get some order. So uh, Armin, um, sure. please go ahead. And then Nora. So we'll do Armin, then Nora. Hey, sir. Um, that was a fantastic lecture. I enjoyed it very much. Just two um, quick comments um, and questions. One about um, the Cartesian revolution or whatever you want to uh, mm -hmm. call it. Um, that you, uh, I didn't, I didn't get what uh, what category did you assign to it? Uh, was it a, a, a processing category or was it a faculty? Because math is really uh, ambiguous entity with regard to these uh, two divisions, in my opinion. That was one question. And the other, just uh, uh, because you called the 26 person, uh, what, stupid? <laughs> Intelligent was <laughs> idiot. I want to say something about the coin, uh, the coin test. Because I think there is a, there is a semantic point. There is a semantic uh, uh, interesting point at play here. Uh, because when we say coin, 
we don't know who Simon Didier almost are. We don't, maybe. We don't know what they, who is it. Yep. Uh, we don't know anything about that. And the trauma that you were talking about was exactly this uh, surrounding interpretation of coin tossing. That uh, in, immediately you go to the uh, understanding and, oh, this is, this is a smart test. So you, uh, I must outsmart this, uh, the smarty that, but the smarty of, uh, that uh, people of this class thought about and wanted to add, outsmart was uh, really an old fashioned smarty. Uh, you are a new smarty. So for, to, uh, to outsmart you, I think. There is another point, uh, but maybe there is there's something in the test that becomes uh, misinformation because when thirty person answered the test, and I think I don't remember my answer. I remember that I think about the problem as you as you as you call, as you told as you talked about it. Uh, I, I think about the maybe this is a uh, sure this is a Brazilian thing because uh, the ten co how 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 could you toss a coin um, ten times um, and I remarkably talked about. The, the um, anyway that, that's not important but uh, also maybe this is this is the guy that wants to be smart and wants to be pro wants to see how probabilities work and everybody maybe maybe try to do something like me maybe if I if I uh, answer 50 I don't remember really but uh, the thing is the the point the, the point becomes if we abstract from the semantic of coin and the test the, th the thing become a, a, an information about a test that 30 people who almost are um, intelligent uh, uh, somehow, uh, maybe not, uh, because the, <laughs> the demographics, the demographics uh, show something else. Um, they are wrong. The, the, wrongness of the, uh, the, the wrongness of people uh, then um, uh, would it be, if true, if Bayesian, Bayesian view, would that be um, uh, evidence for something in the test to be fishy? Thank you. Sorry to take a long time. No, no, this, this, this is great. So let, let me just speak to these, these, these two questions together. So um, the, the first thing is, yeah, the, the, the story here is that this Cartesian discovery of literally the use of algebra for geometry opens the door to a process notion of intelligence, right? Um, intelligence is previously, let's say, reasoning about reality, in this case, geometry, right? Circles and lines are real, right? Mathematical objects are in the room with me right now. Um, and yet what, Cart what Descartes did or what that moment enabled us to do is transform all of those questions about reality into this purely syntactic manipulation. Uh, we could start getting, uh, we, could, we could be intelligent simply by a process, not via cunning, let's say. Uh, so that's the first thing. The second thing, so I, 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 I wanna be clear, right? If you answered 50-50, it's not that you yourself are dumb, right? Um, it's much more likely that you're giving an answer that you know is dumb for cunning reasons, right? I think that might be the better way to say it is we know in some sense, if you actually took the question seriously, and again, if I, if I you know, you were to imagine yourself like on the street in New York or Rio or something, right? Or, you know, you're at a party, right? And you're actually asked to, to make that judgment. You would not say, you know, you would not place those bets, right? You would place a very different kind of bet. And of course, the kind of bet you placed, you know, that is not when the game really gets going, right? It's then you get into the, um, you know, do you feel lucky punk moment, right? So to be really clear, it's, it's, and I think this is, when I say this word trauma, I really mean it, right? Like the process theory of intelligence has so taken over education that people with cunning, people with the faculty of intelligence spend a lot of their time, like make lying to themselves or entering some kind of gigantic simulated reality where they say, well, look, I want X, I want to hang out with Patrick and John. So I got to figure out what the answer this goddamn gatekeeper wants from me, right? So, um, so I just put that out there just to be really clear that I, I mean, out of deep respect, right, that we're in this kind of bizarre bind. Um, and that in fact, it's actually, this can sound a bit crazy, right? It's actually um, a great, it's a moment of great vulnerability. Those who didn't answer 50-50 are also taking quite a big risk. And they're saying, you know what? I'm gonna take this question seriously. Like, even though this is a fake Google form and you're a fake professor and professorships are fake and the whole thing, I'm still actually going to, do the honor of, of, of giving a different answer. So I, I, I wanna put that out there, Armin, just as a, as a, as a way to speak to that. Um, let's keep going. Nora, you're, you're, you're up next, hello. Thank you. Um, so I, I'm interested in sort of double clicking on the matrix versus process distinction. And mm -hmm. like, maybe I have some suspicion, or that, I don't know, maybe I wanna sort of get to the point of like, do they, do this, does this distinction at some point just collapse again? So that's sort of two sub thoughts and then maybe you just wanna to talk to them. Um, so the first one is, so in the Mete story, um, 
part of me is like, hmm, so like, how can we get to Mayday? It's like, how much does it come down to just suggesting that there's some sort of intentionality? Like in the chariot race story, right? The agent has a story about what success looks like. And I could also tell a story that they use a process and then they sort of check, is this bringing me to, to what I care about? And if it doesn't, then they update their process somehow. And that up and that they use some other sort of symbol, symbolic process again. Um, and the updating of the, those processes itself is a process. So it like sort of inflates again to like being all process based. Mm -hmm. um, while so I understand the distinction, but I'm like, what what sort of distinction is this really? Or just do, does it inflate? And um, the the fact that the myth just relies on the subjectivity of some agent having this like perspective of some I care about something versus not um, mm -hmm. seems seems relevant and is that what we want in the theory about intelligence or how, how to place that yeah no this is great Nora so I mean the, the standard way that this gets cashed out right is that we have um, we have a process method right like Bayesianism but then we also have a set of goals right we have a utility so you know people want a million dollars like secretly hidden inside the one box two box question is like the idea that look obviously everyone wants a million dollars right so uh, or at least they prefer there's a preference ordering a million versus a thousand those those kinds of things um once you have a preference ordering then all of this stuff grinds through it's things called the representation theorems discovered by frank ramsey um allow you to to grind things through now here's the paradox though is that um that the 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 distinction collapses and so for any particular process right um, you can attach a set of utilities to make sense of that agent. It's just that the utilities could be really strange. So the classic example is, um, you know, uh, there's some guy, right? And he's like, he's got a knife, got a blunt knife. And he's like trying to, hack, sorry, this is like a Reza body horror thing, right? He's like trying to cut off his toes with a blunt knife. And so, ah, okay, like, what is the process intelligence? Like, he hands the guy a sharp knife, right? And of course that, you know, assumes like a set of goals that the agent has. And of course the perhaps more intelligent thing is to take the knife out of the guy's hand and convince him not to cut off his toes, right? So the, the, where the process um, story tries to reinsert intentionality is through the attribution of goals, but there's no real way to distinguish the goals from the reasoning process. They actually kind of merge and mingle. Uh, I used to have this um, problem when I taught, um, I would teach like social science and I would, you know, give accounts of how people behaved. And I would say, look, this clearly shows that people aren't utility maximizers. And then in the back of the room, there was always every year at the Institute when I teach this, there's a guy in the back of the room, he's always a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. He'd always raise his hand and be like, nope, I can do it. Like I can, I can show you exactly how to set up a series of goals the agent has to produce exactly that behavior. So um, I think Nora, your, your question is really deep and it's gonna come, I think, in and out over and over again, like how we collapse this, you know, your grandmother says, oh, you're so smart. And this kind of, this process model, how these things collapse and, and break apart again. But I'm glad you sort of brought this up. So thank you. Um, I have Keith um, and then I saw Felipe lowered his hand. So we'll do Keith and then we do Alex. So Keith, please. Yeah, very, thank you. Uh, very, very interesting. Uh, so let me, let me read my question. Uh, so in the Cartesian revolution, uh, so we discovered the analytic method versus a more syntactic method of, uh, of geometry. Uh, perhaps in my, in my opinion, kind of this, this tension of the synthetic versus analytic is perhaps one of the biggest engines of progress in mathematics. But I don't think it is the only one I think there is also be other big tensions uh, that are like the finite, infinite tension. So I am not sure if perhaps this is kind of too simplified as just thinking about this in, in this, only this uh, kind of axis. But uh, I, I, don't know, I don't know how to kind of incorporate this other than perhaps just uh, many different axes of intelligence. Yeah, thank you. No, this, this is great. No, I, I'm, I'm like, this is a, such a wonderful question because um, so I'm, I'm not a monomaniac, but I would say that this, this Metis process distinction may actually uh, be one of the fundamental ones that also underlies this, this tension between the finite and the infinite. Um, uh, computation, at least in the second lecture, we'll see this computation 
is the basic story of process that we have in the post-Cartesian sort of Alan Turing era, right? What it means to manipulate things syntactically, right? Like, you know, Descartes didn't have this notion, Leibniz maybe had it, was basically you build a computer, right? And the computer is gonna manipulate, put the red and the blue symbols together and do the magic, you know, put it through the tombola, right? So those kinds of calculations are understood fundamentally as discrete and finite operations. So all of the theory of computation is based around the possibility of finitude. I, I didn't realize how seriously people took this. Um, and again, maybe this is a psychoanalytic story. People who really believe in process, and, I, and I, I know and love many of these people and have gone to conferences with them and they're really good people. Um, they, they, people who believe in process also actually don't believe in the infinite, uh, which I think is absolutely miraculous. So I'm a, I'm a physicist, right? I, it, it, like infinities are everywhere. Like we're just, you know, like it's truly everywhere. But if you actually believe that intelligence is process, uh, the intelligence is computation, it's actually really tempting to believe that the in infinite doesn't exist. And what does that actually mean? So from the point of view of a, um, a physicist, for example, there's an infinite number of points between any two, you know, there's an infinite number between any two points, right? So between here and here, there's an infinite, there's an infinitude of points, there's an infinity. But um, you know, for those who take a purely computational view of the world, who view, for example, the world as a simulation, something can't be true about that because as we'll see, um, some of those points will be uncomputable. They can't actually be the product of any process. So oddly enough, and I, I, you're, very, you're totally correct, the tension between the finite and the infinite is a source of great fecundity in mathematics. Uh, I would say it actually may even mirror this same kind of analytic synthetic tension that we see in the case of Descartes. So they, some, in some deep sense, they may actually be roots of some, you know, sort of shadows of some even deeper tension between those two, the two points of the world. Keith, does that make sense? That's a rather abstract. Um, yes, yes, I do understand. And perhaps let me complement a little bit uh, yeah. as well. So something that I actually was listening yesterday is that these uh, analytic thinkers, uh, just like Descartes, Leibniz and Turing, they have this, they have this way of trying to build kind of a, a machine to do anything. For example, Descartes wanted in his in his book Geometry, he he has started to, uh, trying to build uh, not only with ruler and compass any curve, but he constructed uh, kind of this imaginary like multiply connected rulers and compass to build any curve, mm -hmm. just like just like Turing wanted to compute any computable function, and just like Leibniz wanted to create a machine to build all knowledge. So it is very related. However, I am not sure if it's exactly the same thing, but <laughs> that's perhaps my yeah. opinion. I didn't, I know, and I, I didn't mean to, to suggest they were exactly the same thing. Maybe, you know, you're just, these are, everyone's asking these great questions. This, these seem maybe to be the, the sense that I have that they're related to each other is, is because they are, but via something deeper that I haven't certainly made sense of. But thank you, Keith. Let's just make sure we get people in this great. Um, Alex, and then after Alex, Claudia. So Alex, hey, it's good to see you, by the way. Hey, yeah, uh, good to see you again, likewise. Um, I think the Metis process distinction, um, to me, it seems like it's a refusal to assign a process to intelligence. Uh, and I think a lot of things about intelligence sort of there's a lot of the sort of missing evidence here that I think makes it a, a, not, a sensible thing to say, not answering this question. Um, we know something happens, but we're not sure what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, and thus we can't assign a process to it. So, sorry, Alex, I, did I, okay. I mean, I, I think you've just, you've, you've given me a provocation. I, um, I think it's a very good one. I, um, I think you might be asking, um, if Metis is not a process, what could it be, right? I, I think it's, I think Metis to me is, is the provocation. It's mm. saying mm. Metis is not a process mm. and you can't think of it like that, but, it, but then a refusal to give any more information. Right, it's, it's I mean, it's sort of like asking, um, you know, I mean, I, I'm sort of with you, right? When, I'm, when I think about Odysseus, I mean, I used to think this way and now I've talked myself out of it, but 
maybe I've only sort of cheated myself out of it. I want to say like Odysseus, like, you know, he like, what's his process, right? You can imagine Odysseus writes the book, like how to think like Odysseus. Um, there was a book written recently, you know, how to think like Sherlock Holmes, which I thought was kind of a lovely book. Um, the idea that somehow these, um, there might be some underlying process that Odysseus is computing, right? That gives him this kind of universal faculty. There's something really tempting about that. Um, but I mean, in this, you don't, don't hate me, right? Like, here's another answer, right? If it's not a process, what is it? Well, like maybe Athena whispers into his ear, right? Um, you know, how does Archilochus do it? Well, maybe his dad just helped him out. Like Nestor is like, look, I, I'll give you the advantage, right? Um, at the same time, I mean, so that's kind of the, the sort of silly answer. We don't believe in goddesses anymore. Um, but, you know, underlying that might be something a little bit more sophisticated. Um, certainly Metis itself, even the Greeks had a sense that Metis was somehow generalizable. Odysseus had something that applied in many different situations. He wasn't just good at like tricking, um, you know, narcissistic idiolacs like the Cyclops, right? That wasn't just his skill. He also had this skill of like charming princesses, right? Um, he also had this skill of, you know, um, calming, you know, arrogant young men. And so because these skills, they seem to come from so many different domains, they seem to be, we, we wanna say, well, there must be something underlying all of them. There must be something that in possessing those faculties Odysseus has, and then being perhaps Cartesians, the only thing we can think of that generalizes is process. And maybe that's the answer in the end. Maybe like I'm just creating problems out of nothing. It is just process. Um, but I just wanna leave that open because certainly many of us have thought that and then we've built machines and we just try to give them better and better processes and somehow that isn't giving us the machines we want. So maybe that's a little provocation in return to say, yeah, I wanna believe that too. And like many smart people, like Herb Simon at CMU, right? Like everyone, that's the thought, right? Is we just juice up that process enough and we'll get Metis. But I, I don't know, I, that's what I wanna leave open there to a certain extent. But I think you're right that it's, it's not an easy one. Um, let's make sure I have Claudia. So hello, Claudia, joining us from a car. Hi. Yeah, I just went hiking with my dog and I got into this class on the way back. Um, anyway, yeah, so I think your answer to the last question kind of maybe partially answers my question, but I guess my problem was my like kind of question that I was confused about is in the first part of your lecture today, you talk about Odysseus as Metis where he's just, you know, he's good at things. Um, he charms princesses, he uh, outwits people, like this chariot guy also outwits people, all of these wittiness. And then you said something about like kind of this Cartesian mathematics sense of intelligence where he's trying to perform what you see him to imply is supposed to be some kind of like isomorphism from real life land to symbol land and then you do some procedural calculations in symbol land and then you go back mm -hmm. and i'm i'm just kind of like lost on how that has anything to do with like odysseus's form of like cunning i guess because when you see you know, people who charm princesses and come up with witty little puns that they can use to like twist their way out of situations, they're not being cerebral about it. They're not like, like the people who like thrive in symbol land are not the people who are like succeeding in that sense. <laughs> so I, I just like have my doubts about this like very like nerdy sense of intelligence and just, like, I, as like a suggestion for like kind of like what I'm thinking kind of like where where my confusion lies like I'm thinking about Nietzsche and where there's two sort of like strategies in life where he's got like the cunning ones and he's got like the strong ones and like people who try to outwit and twist the system in upon itself to win versus people who just win and like Odysseus seems like the latter, like the person who just wins, like is naturally good at everything. And then there's also this kind of like symbolic realm. And then there's also the cunning, like these just seem like three different concepts. I don't understand what the uniting factor is that brings them all together for your lecture. Um, so I'm sorry, I just rambled at you. I, I don't uh, know if that made my confusion clear. No, no, this is, this is great, Claudia. So, I mean, the first thing I'd say is that um, this, you know, tacking on this process account to Metis is is fake, or it's it's a it's a reconstruction, right? The Greeks, I mean, Patrick will correct me, but um, you know, this is not really what's going on 
um, you know, in the Odyssey, it's not that, you know, ah, Odysseus has this great process, right? He's got this great algorithm. He's got myelinated neurons that enable him to keep more symbols in play than other people do, right? Um, that's, of course, how we talk about it today, right? We give out, we, we, you know, we would, we would judge Odysseus's cunning by how well he could manipulate symbols, right? We give him an IQ test, right? Um, but I think that's, I think you're precisely right that 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 account is an account that comes afterwards. It's such a pervasive account that I think we have to think about it and talk about it. But your intuition is um, perhaps even stronger than mine that there's something really deeply wrong about that account. Um, of course, then you have this problem though, if you know, the one thing the process thing does is at least it tells you something more about what intelligence is other than simply getting out of the Cyclops' cave, right? It, it, it produces in some sense an explanation, if only because it explains the left-hand column, right, winning the chariot race in terms of some totally different thing on the right-hand column, the manipulation of symbols. So I, I think the, the, the challenge is, the, the challenge for the non-process people, and we're gonna do this, it's just a much harder challenge, is how do you explain Odysseus? I mean, I, I gave this joking answer to Alex, right? Well, you know, Athena whispers into his ear, um, and to a certain extent, that's what happens in the in the Odyssey. Uh, it's what happens in the Iliad, right? Nestor whispers into his son's ear, gives him the gives him the answer ahead of time. There's a cunning there, but of course, that can't be the final explanation, right? It, it can't just be pure divine inspiration. We see we feel like there's something systematic going on, or at least there's something happening other than pure, let's say, luck. Uh, one one question I had is, you know, is it smart? I, I was going to open with this: Is it smart to win the lottery? Right. And uh, the answer is, well, you know, if I've just won the lottery, most of us would say, well, how did you win the lottery? Did you just buy a ticket and win? In that case, I'm not sure it's so smart. So there's some complexity to the winning of Metis that we need to uncover. The Cartesian story gives us an answer. So next in, on Sunday, next Sunday, we'll like we'll have this whole game where we, you know, once we make that Cartesian bet, all these answers start flowing out the other side. If we don't want to make that, then we'll see. That's the third, the third Sunday we'll have. Um, I wonder if there's some kind of like function of fittedness to the environment mm -hmm. that incorporates both the symbolic transformation where, you know, if you have a good symbolic transformation where your symbolic manipulation happens to, you know, fit well to the environment, like you're set. If mm -hmm. you're just chadly like Odysseus, you're set. Um, if you just had some kind of intuition in your gut that this is the day I win the lottery and you can't explain it in any kind of rational terms, but I don't know, there's something science can't explain. Uh, mm. There's just some kind of je ne sais quoi of fittedness to the environment. Maybe that's the way to conceptualize intelligence. I think that's, I mean, I, I, these, are, these are great questions, Claudia. I, one thing I want to quarrel with, but I don't think Odysseus is a Chad, right? I mean, if I have, you know, like, he's-, he's actually, <laughs> Well, right? not Chadly in like the like, Twitter Achilles sense, is Chad, I'm sorry. Right? Um, but yeah. no, but I mean, what I mean by that is that I think he's like the whole point of, and at least, you know, this is the claim in this lecture, right? Is that um, it's the ability to, to, to get the unnatural outcome, right? He's, he actually is sort of winning against nature, right? Our, uh, Antilochus is winning against nature. He's winning in a way that the natural order of things is not, is, is he's violating that natural order, right? And so there's something- Well, what's the natural order? Well, so fit, well, maybe we should pick that up. I want to make sure this is, and these are good questions and maybe I can try and put that into the next talk. Let me make sure we just get to one or two other questions because I do want to make sure we have people before we shift over. Um, yeah, so I, no, no, this is great, Claudia. And I, I, I mean, what is fittedness to the, I mean, winning because you're fitted to the environment is not Metis, right? Um, the person who's fitted to the environment of winning in that chariot race is Menelaus, right? Uh, Antilochus is not fitted, and yet Thumetis achieves this fittedness in some way, kind of overcomes it. But I think your definition of fittedness is like problematic then, because who's winning? Well, in that case, there's somebody who ought to win, and Menelaus does indeed say it, right? He's like, I, I should have won that, like the fitting thing, and no one disagrees. And in fact, Antilochus is like, yeah, you're right. Then you're Remember? like, coming into like moral definitions of ought, which. Mm -hmm. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, Can I suggest a compromise? Okay. Mm -hmm. A fittedness rather than fittedness. Maybe, okay. Um, I, yeah. 
maybe I think hey, that... intervene uh, so for just a little bit, maybe, maybe to settle the settle the discussion by a theatrical um, theatrical point, uh, because he. Um, 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 Ajax is the uh, the great hero of uh, the Greeks, and Ajax is who uh, supposed to be the hero of the old, and um, the Ulysses is supposed to be the hero of the prophet of pro philosophy. In the uh, in the in the story, of course, that Ulysses is the child, but uh, in, in in our in our view, but he's supposed to be the virgin that wins against the old eyes. Because the child is really the, the great uh, warriors in the um, army of the Greek that has lost the has, has lost their everything has um, um, that that's supposed to be the story or the the um, allegory. So that the fitness then would be the fitness for battle for something like that. I think I mean when 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 I think about fitness to the environment, right? It's the question is how do we recognize intelligence? And um, one way we recognize it is a violation of the order we expected. Right, at least that's that's the claim, right? That Menelaus should have won. How did Archilochus? Well, he must have been pretty cunning, and indeed he was cunning, right? Now, um, in the modern era, right, the Metis thing, right? The people who tend to win are the people who you know work at Rentech or something, right? They're they're the coders and programmers. So now the true cunning is a very different form of cunning. The person who wins might be the you know the traitor going on his gut. I'm, I'm trying to make sense of this concept, and I, I think you're right though, Claudia, that the, the question of fittedness is, is, a, is a tricky one. In the moment, perhaps, we I, recognize I think, it, but yeah, go on, sorry. I think also like your definition of intelligence, like when you say it's like flouting expectations, it's like, what if my expectations just kind of suck? Like, I don't, I don't expect people, you know, naively a couple of years ago, I was very surprised to find out that some of the happiest and most mentally stable people in the US are also in very low income regions without the services that I would have considered a couple of years back essential mm -hmm. to my happiness. Like, I'd, like what sets those expectations in the horse racing contest it's we're trying to judge the fastest horse and the bestest driver wow i just said bestest anyway um like that's what we're trying to judge by the co by the contest so the context kind of kind of sets your expectations and mm -hmm. then you flout them so if you're participating in this sort of like i don't know symbolic game of a horse racing contest sure mm -hmm. you're flouting expectations i mean maybe it's just like subversion of the language game in a sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is like kind of my thought but if I'm like coming fr I don't think I'm that smart just because maybe I come from a different say cultural background I enter into a different language game I've been taught by my culture all of these like cool things that like I don't know maybe I bring like you know Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court maybe I bring like some kind of electricity to the 1600s do you think that guy's necessarily that smart well he is but that's beside the point right like he just like has knowledge that makes him more fit into the environment because he's playing a totally different game than these other guys. I think like if you're like subverting the expectations of the game and calling that intelligence, it's really dependent on context and expectations, which means that you can be wildly misled. I think that's right. And maybe, maybe I want to say that Odysseus is in this notion of intelligence that we're kind of coming around to, Odysseus is the hacker, right? He's not the great coder, necessarily, he's the person who hacks the system in some way. And, you know, as I remember years and years ago, there are script kiddies, right? There are people who hack the system just by pushing a button. And in some sense, that's when we start to break apart these ideas, right? That even if you subvert the system, maybe for some reason that's not fair. You just have a script that you ran, right? Maybe it's not fair, you had a time machine, right? You hacked the system, but maybe that hacker is not somebody, like now all of a sudden our notion of hacking is less, is less celebratory. Um, I do want to make sense, I make sure we get to people. So I have um, Blake and then Povlias and then Jacob. So let's do Blake if, if we can. Blake, are you there? Great, yeah. All right, well, thank you. Um, so when you talked about the wisdom of the crowds, you had this example or, or you're talking about how our economy ends up being this intelligent process, right? That can compute things that no, no individual could compute. But right. you distinguished it that you said, well, if, it, if that intelligent process could only do metas, then, you know, capitalism would work or something. Right. Um, so my question is, well, how do we get our economy to not only be a computation process, but to be a Bayesian one, right? To be one that actually is um, 
I mean, and would that be metas? But how do we get the economy that's this intelligent computation to actually be, uh, you know, getting us what we want? Um, I, I mean, that's, you know, if I had that answer, I would, you know, if any of us had that answer, I, I suggest we write it down and, and mail it, you know, into the world government, right? Uh, I mean, that is, you know, that is- Or the, where do you think the gap is? Where's your suspicion of like, why, why is there a gap? Why, why, isn't, why does that not guarantee us that we have what we want already? I don't know. I mean, it's uh, the price mechanism. Gosh, like I, it's, it, this is a question I, 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 I'm glad you've asked the question. It means it means that I've given a good enough lecture that you've gotten excited about this. But I have, I just have no answer. Um, I want to be good and not and not speculate in part because I haven't. I just I don't know the right answer. Let me give a kind of oblique answer, a cunning answer. Uh, which is say like this is a question we have in when I teach the uh, I teach a version of this class and we we talk about okay how would you aggregate people's guesses in order to get the outcomes right so um, this is not the first time that my survey of guess the way to my Subaru has failed um, the uh, the other time it failed was actually when I was teaching at Indiana and I was I always do this live this is the first time I haven't done a live but so I did this in Indiana and you know it worked and it worked and then one year it didn't work. And I realized, well, why didn't it work? And the reason it didn't work is that year the, the Google Forms thing failed. And my TA, Alexander, couldn't, couldn't get the, you know, people wrote on a piece of paper instead. And so the class was so tightly packed that Alexander had people just read out their guesses as they, as they went around the room. And um, so the guesses were terrible, right? So, the, you know, instead of getting it to within a couple hundred pounds, they were off by a thousand pounds. And I actually went back and I was like, this sucks, how did this, how did this happen? I actually got the original paper that people had written their answers on. What had happened was that people wrote a guess. Then when people went around the room and, and said their guess, people changed their guess, right? So somebody guessed 10,000 pounds, let's say, then other people guessed 2,000 and they crossed out 10,000, wrote in 2,000. And so by a, a, a process of hurting, they had actually ruined the whole experiment. I could see this because I could actually see where people had crossed out their answer, written a new one because they didn't want to look like they were cheating. So these are really small pieces of, let's say you wanted to have a machine, right? That, that you know, cunningly gave us life, um, how you might think about designing the machine better. So um, let me go, oh, sorry, let me make sure I have, um, uh, Povlias, I think, was up next. So Povlias, are you there? Uh, yeah, and do you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, okay, so I have a more general question, I guess, as compared to the others. And uh, so, uh, in my opinion, like uh, this Bayesian reasoning and and uh, is very similar to the logic itself. When it got popular, it's it, it has to kind of translate this uh, spatial spatial temporal like reality into this symbolic rep representation. Mm -hmm. uh, but then in, in this process, you, you kind of lose time often, like uh, it's uh, this dimension of time gets projected. And, mm -hmm. and this might be a problem and might cause paradoxes, you know, and uh, maybe it's a, a, a better uh, uh, way of modeling is just uh, running some dynamic system simulation and just uh, and it, it results as, as this uh, uh, mm. less reasoned, as, as you would say, maybe less Bayesian, but but more like Meta's uh, solution. Mm -hmm. like I, this is a really nice point because you, you're you're bringing up this distinction between the Cartesian move, which is to take reality and put it into an algebraic syntactic form and grind through, uh, versus simulation. And I I don't think actually simulation would have occurred to to Descartes the idea that one could actually, you know, sort of simulate circles as they were. What really struck him was the extent to which algebra was in no way like geometry. There was nothing circly about x squared plus y squared, right? There was nothing, they, these things had no properties in common. They shared a representational logic, but not a, a property logic. Whereas simulations, they're almost like kind of an older form where we have something, we, we create something that is in some way akin to the first thing, right? It's, um, it's not a schematic, it's a painting, or it's, it's some, there are properties or resemblances that are shared. So I don't quite know actually how to, how to bring those two together, whether the simulation story is just another process story by other means. Certainly when we do Bayesian reasoning, for example, we often run as part of that simulation. So when we say, you know, 
probability of scenario given fair, we might actually simulate universes in which the coin is fair. Um, so I don't know, you're, you're raising a really interesting question, one I don't have, I don't know too much about, which is the relationship between the Cartesian notion of, of representation through algebra and let's say something more like Laplace's demon, where we have some uh, sort of effective simulation of the world without a need to transition. We create a model of the world in some way in our hand. So I think that's a, that's a, lovely, that's a lovely point. Um, let me, uh, we have one last person I think, which is Jacob. We'll take Jacob's question and then uh, Trung will um, lead us into our breakout discussions. So the way we're gonna do the breakout discussions is uh, Trung will email um, people in the class the, the link for the, the CMU Zoom link uh, that will take you to those breakout discussions. We'll then organize people into those discussions there through breakouts. Trung, are you there? I hope. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. So Great. I will send out the email now. Excellent. Yeah, send out that email. Um, and um, what I'll do here, we'll, we'll take Jacob's question and then we'll go to the CNU Zoom link and we'll see how well this works. And hopefully this will all work really, really smoothly. Um, so, um, uh, oh, I, I just, I can't resist as Armin brings up, isn't this Newcomb Paradox part of this eschatology Pascal wager? I think there are some there are some really lovely similarities between them. Certainly, the way some of the people who hang out with Yukowski uh, take these kinds of questions, it really is a kind of retro causality story. Um, but that's uh, I think something for maybe the breakouts. Um, Jacob, um, you you are our last person on the on the joint Q and A. Thank you. Um... So to, in an answer to a previous question, you gave as a as the alternative to a process account of intelligence that Athena just whispers in Odysseus, Odysseus's ear and gives him the answer. Um, but to me, that just sounds like a process. The process is Athena whispering. And then you can ask, OK, well, then how does Athena know the answer? And either there's another process there or you say, no, Athena is like the essence of wisdom. And therefore, but that just then to me is either it's a tautology or it's like, it's unknowable. It's just making a claim that there's, it's unknowable how Athena knows um, what to say. So it seems to me like, to me, it's like there you have a process account where you're actually making a claim that there is no way to give an account. It's totally beyond what's knowable. So I'm wondering if that, if you agree with that or, or no, there is some other option in there. Yeah, no, I mean, this is, this is a really hard thing. So let's, let's, um, let's, let's try to, to, to take it very slowly through this claim, right? The, the, what is the process account? The process account is that you, you take the real world and you transform questions about the real world into a symbolic system. And that symbolic system no longer has any semantics, meaning there's no relationship of meaning between the symbols and the things they represent, or rather that relationship of meaning is irrelevant to what happens next. Those symbols get juggled purely according to a set of syntactical rules, right? It's like, Okay, once I've transformed, um, you know, some statements are red statements, some statements are blue statements, and there's this syntax that tells you how red statements blew on to blue ones, things like that. There's some kind of rule-based, non-semantic, non-meaningful um, uh, notion of process. So somebody asks, does process have to mean symbolic process? In this case, is how we're using it, right? This is this Cartesian, this is this shorthand for the Cartesian story that we're telling, right? So it's really tempting to say, well, you know, if, if Odysseus is not transforming the world into a symbolic system, manipulating it and coming out, you know, computing and coming out with an answer, um, then, you know, if Athena's telling him, then, well, what's Athena doing, right? We, how does Athena get this kind of knowledge? And I think that's actually, a, that's a really deep question, right? What accounts are there of intelligence that aren't simply about the manipulation of symbols in some way? Uh, so that's a question we'll try to answer. Um, in the next, on this coming Sunday, we'll go to town on the symbolic case, right? So we'll dig really deeply into this Cartesian story and see you know, how far we can take it. But in the third Sunday, when we talk about intelligence as knowledge, and then the fourth Sunday we talk about as reflection, we'll come up with some answers that make sense of, of intelligence as something, let's say, for example, as having a semantic component as well. That when you, when you juggle these ideas, you have to consider their meanings out in the world as well as their sort of purely syntactic properties. Um, I don't know, Jacob, if that, if, that, if that speaks to your question as much. It's, uh, it's a way for me to sort of, it's very useful for me to try to make that clear, uh, but I'm not sure if that, if that addresses your thoughts. Um, 
I guess we'll see based on the, the second two lectures, but it, but it does somewhat, I, I apologize, I missed the beginning of the lecture. So I think I missed when you defined how you were using <sighs> process as, um, no, that's but, so yeah, so yeah. yeah, that helps, thanks. Yeah, no, not, not at all, not at all. I mean, it's, yeah, we wanna use this word process in this very syntactic way um, that, you know, we'll, we'll, it'll appear over and over again. There are processes that are not purely syntactic. And so one of those, for example, is evolution. And we'll, we'll hopefully get around to those. Um, I, so, I suspect uh, that uh, maybe I suspect that maybe even as early as next week uh, we'll be able to problematize the entire syntax semantics distinction. I think that's right. I think that's right, John. You know, depending on how well we we set each other up for our for our conversation. Um, so, um, if you're in the class, you should have gotten an email from Trung giving you a CMU link. So, I suggest you now go to that CMU link, check your email, and find the CMU link. Um, uh, Let's just take a random sample here. Alex, if you're there, can you tell me, did you, um, did you get an email from Trung giving you the link to the uh, Zoom? Uh, I, I did. I, I was just about to click the open Zoom US button. Uh, in all right. So um, let's all join each other um, there so we can manage the breakout rooms. So thank you very much. And we'll see each other in a moment in a separate Zoom room. <laughs>